Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the CD Sport Podcast with me, Kerry Davis. Joining us today is 1FC fighter, multiple Muay Thai champ, including the WMC and the CMT champ, Daniel Mini T. Williams. How are we, bro? Good, Kerry. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate oh. you getting up super early to have a chat. Yeah, that's good, man. Pre- appreciate you coming on. Like you said, I, I normally appreciate when I do people from Australia, New Zealand, normally say I'm getting up early, but... Uh, you're like, nah, bro, you're up, you're up, a, well, quarter to five alarm this morning. Oh, man, good effort. But no. Yeah, I'm definitely not a morning person, so <laughs> you did do that. Good on you. Fair play to you, all right. I um, I was telling my mates, I was like, fuck, mini tea's on the ball. Like, obviously, uh, Doyley's hooked us up. Uh, shout out to Ryan Doyley. He's been on the podcast yeah, as well. Ryan. And, uh, like, I messaged you on Instagram. And, like, you full-on give me, like, a time slot and everything, you know? It was like... <laughs> That's the most professional uh, guest I've had on. Normally, they're like, oh, yeah, I'll come on at this time. And then I jump online and then I'm like waiting maybe half hour, 20 minutes for them to come on. And they're like, shit, sorry. Uh, yeah, but, I guess uh, it's like, yeah, got to make it easier for you. Because, yeah, just saying like, yeah, around this time, then you have to figure it out. And you don't want to step on anyone's toes. So. No, mate. Yeah. Uh, like I said, appreciate you having on, especially with some of your fight caliber. I was... um. Obviously, when I knew that you were coming on, I went back to watch some of your fights with uh, Andy House then back a few years ago. That was for the yeah the CMT. That's a CMT belt, that wasn't it? Yeah, the old cage Muay Thai promotion. Yeah. So that was like the original Muay Thai with those gloves mm. that John Wayne Park put on. And um, had two fights on there, two title shots. And yeah, it was really good. And that's why when sort of one started doing that, that was just one of my goals. Hey, just like, oh, sweet. They're doing Muay Thai with those gloves now. And the fact that I was doing MMA as well, it's like, oh, man, I could do all three with this promotion. So just like um, one was sort of always like a promotion I had in my head that I wanted to get into. Yeah. And, yeah, it's funny how that happened, actually, because um, I had 2020 year, man. That was a pretty uncertain year for everyone. But, um. I made the most of it party wise, I guess. I was just, you know, work stopped and I became like a, a trainer. And a lot of people wanted to train, which is good. So a bit of like flexible money, but multiple trips to the Bottle which is our uh, bottle shop here for alcohol, yeah. um, with other friends that weren't working as well. So a lot of partying, I guess. And I was just in a spot after a while. It's just like, shit, what, I, what am I doing with myself? Like, I haven't trained probably for ages. Like, it'd be cool to have a good, like a, a nice fight, something that motivates me. And this one night after the pub, I hit him up on the contact us form on the internet. So the one FC, like fighter interest, I sent him an email about my profile. Cause I thought, cause I have a Thai citizenship, like my mum's Thai. I, I, I thought that they were, they were still doing fights in Thailand. So I thought, oh, that'd probably be a good way for me to slide in since I'm already a citizen. It'll make it easier for them during this COVID time. But anyway, yeah, I forgot about it because it was a pretty wild night. And just 10 days later, I got the call saying, um, there's an opportunity for you. Um, there's some English fighters that can't get in now because Singapore stopped them coming in because of like the UK strain. Um, but we'll match you with this guy, uh, this Russian guy, and you can sort of be like a backup if one of the English opponents can't come in. So originally I was supposed to fight this Russian dude about five weeks from the actual event that I fought Rod Tang on, mm-hmm. and then that got changed two weeks out to Rod Tang. So it's pretty crazy. Like, just, yep, you want to fight him? Like, 100%. And then, yeah, that's where it sort of left me. How did how, so, so- of Rotang, did he have an opponent? Did he? And that guy pulled out. Yeah, he had an opponent, an English guy, Jacob Smith. I think he's like the UK number one. Mm. And like, yeah, unfortunately, like the Singapore wouldn't allow people from the UK in because of the UK strain that was around that time. Right. Yeah. And I think they were trying to get exemptions, or there was like, yep, he's he's allowed to come in now. Then he's not. He's allowed to come in, and then towards the end like two weeks out it's like yep yeah, okay that we've done our final straw we need to get a replacement for Rod Tang mm. and that's where I slid in man after having like a year off doing nothing and um and then my Muay Thai I hadn't done a Muay Thai fight in about five years because I was just working on my MMA 
And um, so it's pretty cool, pretty crazy how it all happened. And yeah, now I'm well back in it now. So I've got a bit more motivation behind my training. I've got some goals and yeah, it's just, it's cool how it's all happened. Was, sorry, was the Russian dude, was that going to be MMA fight? No, that was going to be a oh, Muay Thai fight. Muay Thai well, um, right. yeah. I actually fought that Russian. He fought Rod Tang before me in a kickboxing match. Right. You know when Rod Tang was like taking all these punches with the big glove? I don't yeah. know if you've seen it. They yeah. play that highlight quite a bit. So it was going to be that guy. And I actually fought him in like the amateur world champs. Um, yeah, right. So it was good. I beat him, but he definitely changed as a fighter. I got a lot bigger. And mm. yeah, so that was going to be the match. But then now nah, I had to get the harder match. They gave me Rod Tang. <laughs> Rod Tang. And people don't know Rod Tang is like, was he like 10 and all now in one as well? Is he? He's like, yeah. He's so he's he's just undefeated in one. And one only, he, he only turned 24 yet, uh, a few days ago. Hey, I, 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 t- I text Doily, right? I go, fuck. I obviously, I looked up Rod Tang. He's had like 320 fights, like 267 wins. I go, he must be about 35, 36, maybe, I don't know, older. Yeah. 24, just turned, uh, July 23rd. <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ. And that's um, with the ties, like for people who don't know much about Muay Thai, like probably most of the fights aren't even recorded either. Is that right, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's um, they, they fight like, well, every week, are they in Thailand? Like, it's Yeah. So mental. in Thai, they can start very young as mm. a source of income for their family, especially in like the poorer farmer regions. Mm. So I think Rod Tang, he started at seven, his first five, wow. and he would have, yeah, what, what's that average? Like probably every three weeks or something since yeah, then, right. kind of, yeah. that he would have been fighting. And the thing with the Thais is they like, um, it's almost like sparring for them in a way mm. um, just because a lot of their fights, especially in the village, they're trying to get the points win, like who's who's the better, more technical fighter, use the kicks and that. So they, they don't get too damaged depending like how big the bets are on the side and stuff like that. So some of them are pretty like unscathed or like quite in good condition after their fight. So they're ready to go again in a few days or the following week. And um, then it's extra money for them too, because you know when it's their income, like they don't want to be too battered. And that's only at the highest level mm. in Thailand in the stadiums where they'll fight less regularly and have bigger per, uh, purses. So yeah, you have a lot of tires that have crazy records. How many, like you know, Rod Tang, for instance, is quite funny walking out. You know, Daniel Mini T Williams, uh, like twenty four wins, eight losses. And then Rod Tang comes out, yeah, 267 wins. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you your Muay Thai. I couldn't find, I found your MMA. I couldn't find your Muay Thai anywhere, your record. So you're 24 and 8 Muay Thai, you? Yeah, right now, 24 8 pro. Nice. And um, yeah, just 3 and 1 for MMA. But like, uh, obviously, you won the. So I want to go back a bit. The CMT is. Um, John Wayne Parr is owns that promote. Well, he used to own the promotion, yeah. And yeah, was he, he was the first? The, was he the first guy to do the cage Muay Thai? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. He's the first one, one to do yeah. it in the actual cage with the yeah. small gloves. So, so I'll just yeah. I'll just say I'll just say briefly too for people who maybe don't know. So Muay Thai not is normally traditionally in like a boxing ring, isn't it? And yeah, you have like the big what size gloves are they? Like boxing gloves today. Yeah, like so ounce, around the, the eight ounce, eight yeah. ounce, eight ounce gloves. Then yeah. and um, so obviously John Wayne Parr, legend of the Muay Thai game, he brought in um, the sport. So it'll be a cage like uh, MMA or UFC cage for people who know. And um, you have the small gloves, so it's pretty much a, a Muay Thai. Well, it's a Muay Thai fight, but it's in a cage, really, isn't it? Is that yeah. much uh, big? Big. Obviously, it's a big difference as well. And is that with the gloves? Yeah, man, my first ever, like, match in the cage. I didn't really change, like, I didn't even train too much in the small gloves. Pretty stupid mm. kind of thing. Just sort of kept the big gloves on and then on the night for the small gloves. I didn't even own a pair. I, I didn't think through training. So um, just sort of kept the same, like, any other Muay Thai fight I trained for. And then jumping in the cage, like, I just felt like I couldn't defend myself. So the first... Yeah. First fight, I fought this dude called Aaron Lee. He was quite the best in Australia at the time. And um, that was sort of him uh, 
everyone wanted to see uh, Aaron Lee versus Andy Housen. Yeah. That was always a match that was talked about uh, for our weight division. And anyway, so 40, I got dropped in the first two rounds, just like, yeah, sh- quick knockdown. It's really unexpected. I'm like, oh, crap. Like the whole fight, I just felt like I couldn't defend myself because the gloves are so small and punches yeah. are getting through. So it's just like a real buzz, like from the first round, just almost like fighting on heart. Like, ah, I just have to strike because if, yeah. if he lands on me, I'm down. That's it. I can't defend myself. <laughs> But then you learn over time, like, yes, you can definitely defend yourself. But mm. just I remember that first fight was just such a rush and just, yeah, it took a bit of damage and, yeah, changed it up for the next one. Got a bit used to the small gloves. And now it's, yeah, that's my favourite way with those gloves. I think mm. that's my favourite style of fighting. Yeah, it's called that one championship, do that with Muay Thai and MMA. Yeah, right. Yeah, Muay Thai, uh, not Muay Thai. One championship, they, they seem to got it down uh I enjoy watching one because it's like you say, you've got the MMA, you've got the Muay Thai in a cage. So obviously they got when it's in the ring, that's just kickboxing for one then, is it? Yeah, so they used to so Thailand, I don't think they had the cage. So if the fight show was in Thailand, they'll just have the ring. Oh right. I think a few countries were like that. So just depending where they were. Mm. Um yeah, they they it would either be in the ring or in the cage. But the kickboxing on the one championship is now just with the big gloves. Yeah. Whereas I think they started off the kickboxing with the small gloves, but I think they changed it, so now it's with the big gloves. Yeah. Not too sure there. Right. right yeah. I'm, What's your favorite style of fighting, Kerry? Like, do you like? I'm. Uh, um, how did how did you get into the uh, martial arts scene? Uh pretty much right. Quite clear, well, two things really. Obviously, when Conor McGregor was on the rise, I was a bit like, Who the fuck's this guy? You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm Welsh and he's Irish and he was making big noise. So, obviously, I started watching when he was up on his rise. But my mate, uh, John Fraser, John Martin Fraser, do you know yeah. John? He's a beast, you know, man. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, yeah, I love well, watching him. Go on. Watching him, yeah, yeah. Is, is he is in, is he in Wales at the moment? Don't yeah, he's in so. Wales. Yeah, it's actually good yeah. now, man, because he's actually doing a I'm not like I'm fucking no fighter whatsoever, but he's like doing some training with me. So he's doing a bit of MMA, uh, bit of K1, and a um, bit of like uh, jiu jitsu and stuff. So it's it's cool, man. He's good. And he's the champ of Eternal. He's middleweight champ. Yeah. So, oh, man. Well deserved. He's like one of those exciting fighters, you know, that could go all the way. Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah. It'd be good to see him on some of the big, like the USC. And yeah. Yeah, he's, um, no, he's definitely exciting, man. It's, obviously, he was a light. He was light heavyweight. You he, he went the right with light heavyweight. Then he lost uh, to Carlos Ulberg. You know Ulberg? He's yeah, signed to the UFC he's now. In the UFC. And he lost a decision there. And he lost to Nathan Reddy. Have you heard of him? From, he was on. He was the champ for Hex. He was undefeated. He only lost to Jimmy Crute. You know Jimmy Crute? Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Jimmy Crute. He went like 11, 12 and 1. So he lost a decision to him. Then John said, oh, fuck this. I'm going to cut some more weights, which he said he Go could have. And uh, as a middleweight, he's undefeated, all finishes, yeah. man. He's, uh, he's putting people oh, away. Sounds like a good change for him. Yeah, so he's... Uh, he's Hopefully he can get a match while he's over your way, is hey, in some of the big promotions there? I, th- I think, I don't want to say, like, too much, but I think because uh, he's contracted to Eternal, I don't know if he can... Right. I don't know, yeah. but I might be wrong saying that. But, uh, yeah, I think yeah. he can. So. Oh, I don't know, there's politics in... A few things and depending on your contract as well what you've signed yeah yeah but i might be wrong i'm not too sure actually but obviously yeah, that- um i told him you're coming on i was like fucking hell yeah i, I fucking love watching uh i think he fought <laughs> maybe one of your cards in perth do you fight in perth when he fought maybe Ulberg or something where have you fought you've he- obviously you fought a few cut fights for eternal haven't you yeah where have you been fighting yeah so in perth uh melbourne and Adelaide, I think. Melbourne. If he yeah. fought, well, he might have fought Allberg in Perth. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, he said. Uh, he I didn't, I didn't see that fight because I mm. think I think I was on the drink already. You know, it's after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. he was called. I think he was called main event for that uh, card. I yeah, get him because I was living. I mean, I used to live in Oz, and he was meant to fight. I was living in Melbourne. He was meant to fight in Melbourne. And like everything was, everything kept changing. And all like uh, his fight got pulled in Melbourne. And then like 
like a week or two out, they were like, oh, you're fighting in Perth now. So I was like, fuck, I couldn't get over there in time, you know? I ah, think it was like a yeah. week out. So I was like, oh, fuck, I, I don't know why I couldn't go. Maybe it was the money or something. But yeah, he had a, he, he was meant to fight, um, you know, Jacob Mal, Malcoon. He's in UFC yeah. as well now. Yeah. But uh, Rob Whitaker's training partner. I think he was yeah. meant to fight Jacob. And then Jacob pulled out. And then he went to fight. No, he weren't <laughs> sorry. It wasn't sorry. I remember now. Duke did yeah, he's meant to fight. You have you heard of Duke did yeah? Yep. Yeah. I think he's one of Jimmy Crute's main uh partner, Commonwealth judo wrestler. Yeah. And then Jimmy Crute pulled out. Uh, not Jimmy Crute. <laughs> fucking hell. Duke did pulled out. Say. Duke did yeah. pulled out. And then he had to fight Ulberg. And he he was like, fuck. because he was I think he had quite a heavy grappling camp because he knew Duke was quite a good grappler. And then Carlos Ulberg's obviously uh He's like a champ in New Zealand and kickboxing. Yeah, you know? good, real good striker. Yeah, but yeah, it was a still a good fight. I think it was like a split decision in the end. You know, it was. A, I have to go. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. I have to go watch it. But um, no, he's. A, but that's. I guess that's the thing with the MMA. Hey, like just fuck so many cancellations. People getting injured. It's like mm. a high injury sport, and in Australia, there's not too many fight nights. Like no. you can't just fight as much as you want. You know, so. It's just the kind of scene in Australia. It's, like, it's good eternal. It's like, mm. you know, they're, they're making it possible for people to take the next step, yeah. which is really good. But um, other than them, you're kind of kind of screwed if you want to make it big. How, how, how did you find it, uh, Dan? Obviously, being Muay Thai most, well, all your life, and you said, I'm going to do MMA. Was it, do you find it hard going into like grappling and stuff? Oh man, definitely one of the hardest things. So like I spent the first time when I wanted to actually switch and like commit to it, I basically spent the first two years just getting injured, man. Yeah. <laughs> like with the grappling. So just trying to my you know, banged up Muay Thai body, trying to like, you know, learn jujitsu and bodies going in all different positions. So there's quite a few injuries. And I've never like I was in Muay Thai, like I was quite injury free apart from my hand that I broke a few times but other than that it was pretty good uh injury free career and then coming to MMA it's just like they just kept coming the injuries so yeah it was quite hard and just like the whole meant like endurance for the grappling still something I'm trying to get used to that wrestling sort of endurance mm. and then the five minute rounds because the beauty of fighting Rod Tang that's just really cool. It's a three minute round Muay Thai. And I was like, oh man, that's just awesome. Three minute rounds. Cause with MMA with the five minute rounds, it's mm. just, it's long. It's a long, hard draft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's um, like you said, it's a, it's a different, it's a different fitness. Like, eat, like I said, like two minutes ago, I'm doing a little bit now. And from say, I'm doing a bit of jujitsu, then I'm doing a bit of strike. And I'm like, Fuck, so different, like different, like mm, fitness. Crazy. Like my, my mate again, Ryan Sparky. Shout out to Sparky. He's been on the podcast as well. He's a purple belt in jujitsu, and we we did a bit of funny enough. We did a bit of sparring yesterday, striking, and like he was a bit, he was blowing a bit, and he was saying like, "Fuck me, just standing up and striking to roll in is just too, yeah. you know, it's black and white uh, fit for fitness." Yeah, um, exactly. You're so used to one sport and that when you try to learn something else, it's just completely different. Because I know for the grapplers, yeah, if they have to strike for five minutes, they'll get yeah. exhausted. Exactly, yeah. So what uh, have you gained some belts in jiu-jitsu and stuff? What, uh... Uh, I'm a blue belt. Oh, nice, um, yeah. But I'm trying, like, now, I'm, yeah, because with my, um, so I'm staying ready for, Originally, it was an MMA, then it got changed to kickboxing. Mm. And now that one changed the rules to get into Singapore, so I have to be fully vaccinated. So, yeah, it changes things up a bit. So I've got to think about that. And then I have um, – now I've got a few months at least. Like, I'm just trying to commit to the ground a little bit more just in case I do get an MMA opportunity. I want to be a bit more ready because yeah. when I first – had the MMA fight lined up after the Rod Tank fight. It was, yeah, it was risky, man. Like just the, I had the year off and then I wasn't too consistent with the ground even before that. So coming from, I felt like nothing again to having the MMA fight and I'm surely the guy's going to take me down, you know? Um, 
yeah, it, it was it was a bit of a rush, and I was sparring different people and that, and it's just I wasn't yeah. happy with where I'm at. So I'm just trying to commit to that a little bit more now. Yeah. I have a bit more time. Yeah, yeah, because like your striking obviously is uh it's fucking amazing anyway. So work on your weaknesses, as they say, you know. Yeah, exactly. Just as long as I can still. It's just MMA, you got to sort of train everything. Hey, so it's hard to like yeah. find the time. Wish yeah, I could course. just stop work and train like full time, and that, that's all I can yeah. worry about. <laughs> so you still do a, a full time job as well, do you? You're not yeah, just... so I run like a it's a family business, man. We got like this little natural sort of wellness center. Me and my brother started up about three and a half years ago. Nice, yeah. Um, float tanks, infrared sauna, uh, massage, something else called neurofeedback. And um, it's just something floating I've been doing for the last eight, nine years now, just because first I went there. So in time in the sort of end of high school, I got a bit, um, I wanted to experience new things, you know, so like the psychedelic world and, nice. you know, dropping a bit of acid, mushrooms, just, just really interested in it. And then I've heard about floating through a YouTube video and I heard that you can get a, a hallucinate, you can get a to a hallucinative state just in the float tank. So I'm like, oh man, what's this? There's one in Perth. So I went and tried it and I didn't really get that experience, but my body felt really good and it was like cheaper than a massage too. So nice. I ended up using that as my recovery. And um, yeah, so floating is just something I've always done. And now I promote the use of it to athletes, especially, and just anyone who deals with a lot of stress because it just makes sense to me. You're like you're shutting off all your senses. So your light, your sound, your touch, your smell, and you're forcing yourself to relax, even though you might be stressed out before or like thinking there's no way I'm going to relax. Like if you put yourself in that environment for at least 20 to 30 minutes and push through that initial boredom or whatever you're feeling like your mind's racing, you want to hop out, then you just hit this like sweet spot where you're in that meditative state and you feel really good after just the body's relaxed, your mind's relaxed. And it's almost like being high, you know, after All right. they call it float stone. So natural so way to get high. <laughs> oh, so you, you go in there you won't take nothing you'll just go in a clean head but you feel like you're hallucinating a bit yeah that's well, why i originally wanted to do it but i like it's not yeah and, and never really got what i wanted out of it like these crazy hallucinations but you go in there and you're basically just napping man like yeah, right, you meditate yeah. you just relax super relaxed in there of course yeah like the other day i was having a float and the whole room sort of changed in there when I, I was in like my house kind of thing. Like you have these weird hallucinations, but yeah, yeah nothing where you're like, whoa, what the fuck is that? Yeah, yeah, right. Nothing like other substances yeah. you may use, like the mushrooms and the DMT and all that. Yeah, Rogan's quite a thing about the floor. <laughs> yeah. Rogan, he loves his floor tank as well, doesn't he? He always talks about. Yeah, he's been tanking. using him for years. Mm. Yeah, he promotes the use of him. Because we uh, get a few people come in. Because of Joe Rogan, you know, they mentioned. Oh, really? Him, they to it. Yeah, yeah, so it's good for the industry. Because it, it like for people who don't know what a floor tank is, so it's like a big bubble. Well, just say like a I don't know what shape is it? Like a an egg shape. There's maybe? different types. No. Like we've got a cabin one, which is like mm-hmm. a cabin. Then we got like a pod. So the pod. Oh, that's the word I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's got like. Is it like perfect temperature water with all these salts and stuff in it? Is that right? Yeah. So it has about, well, say our tanks have about, one has 300 kilos of Epsom salt, which is yeah. magnesium sulfate. And um, it feels like water and everything. Mm. And that's what helps you float. So you've got no pressure on your muscles. And then the water is set to about skin temperature, which is around the 34.5 to 35.5. So essentially you don't really feel where the water meets your skin after a while. So you lose that sense of your body. And after a while with the light off and no sound, you don't really smell anything. You just, yeah, you go like quite inwards and it's just yeah. basically your mind in a tank. It's quite therapeutic. Yeah. People using it for uh, pain, pain relief, um, anxiety relief. Like uh, any sort of mental illness that causes a lot of stress, mm-hmm. and I think that's the biggest thing: so a good stress reliever. Yeah. How how often do you try? Obviously, are you in them um, like twice a week, three times a week, or? 
pretty much yeah. like probably yeah at least once a week but i go it depends how i feel man i could go every day sometimes yeah like, yeah it's just like yeah what i want to get out of it so mm-hmm. yeah if i'm with training i'll go on it a little bit in the training camp i'll use it a lot more yeah and um just things like if i haven't slept well the night before like i'll jump in uh, it's just sort of my tool to use yeah. to make the day better you can't drown well you could drown technically but you you're not chances are you're not to eh? if you fall nah, asleep, i think yeah. there's not many like i think yeah. there's the only couple recorded deaths are people who have like one dude was injecting like ketamine into him while he was floating <laughs> <laughs> fair enough man. Yeah. yeah bless him but like fuck yeah that's pretty out there and yeah yeah, yeah he od'd in there and then there was another biohacker dude that did something similar where he was trying to do like wim hof breathing in there and he um he injected himself with the herpes virus and he was a well-known like biohacker in the states and he yeah he died in the tank but that could have been some other causes as well like he's injecting himself with a virus that he thought he could uh, like breathe out using the wim hof method so yeah yeah that's pretty fucking mad that is isn't it (laughs) other than that yeah yeah, so it's really on the individual but yeah there's it's really like there's been no injuries or people drowning in it randomly or anything like that because the water's so dense like even if you are asleep and you try to roll over genuine genuinely you would touch the bottom or you would wake up because the salt stings like hell if you're getting yeah right yeah yeah Yeah. i'd love to try yeah. yeah try one man i'm sure mm. uh, we got our pods from the uk so mm. that would have been england norfolk there's, but there's, there's definitely a few centers all around there's, there's probably some around you well i live quite well country i should say in a village abercrave but uh don't know i think there might be one in swansea have you heard of swansea before wales swansea yeah yeah i've heard of it, it might be one down there yeah. The rugby um, team, I think. That's playing the rugby game when I was little Swansea. I remember that team. Do you? You like your yeah. rugby as well, do you? Oh, uh, yeah, man. I, I like Union. Yeah. Like, I mean, I haven't kept up with it too much in the past few years. I know. Yeah. Did you watch the game in the weekend, British Irish Lions? Yeah, I watched some... it. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was quite nervous. Well, first half was uh, terrible. Well, I thought it was pretty poor for the Lions. Second half, I, I was I was impressed we came back to win, you know? I was, I was chuffed. I was happy. Yeah, um, yeah. My coach was telling me about it. He's um he's Irish and mm. he love he loves his rugby. And yeah, he was up staying up because I think it was like 12, 1 a.m. here or something that it played. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, it's um, we would have had all the mad um yeah the mad Welsh people and in, in the city. I reckon Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. It's a lot of um a lot of British in Perth, isn't it? Yeah, a lot, quite a like, bit. Mm. Just in our gym itself, man, like a lot of our coaches are from the UK or Irish and just, yeah, a lot of our mates are from the UK. I was like, we spoke briefly before you came on. I was like, you okay with my accent? And you were like, yeah, man, I I know. I love love the Welsh accent. Yeah. But um, when I, when I lived in uh, Melbourne, it was a very, like a lot of Irish and stuff, but like I'd meet people like when I was in work on site and stuff and they'd be like, fuck, you're the first Welsh person I've ever met. It's always Irish or English. But um, Yeah, that's common. Meet. Yeah, we don't meet too much Welsh people here. But like, but like you said, obviously, when uh, it's a big, say, rugby game on, when I was in Australia, I'd go to the pub at like 3 a.m. And then all like the Welsh would come out the woodwork end and you see loads of Welsh <laughs> yeah. there and you start talking and like, fuck, you live like not far, you live like 20 minutes away from me. Right. You know, it's, uh, it's good. Uh, yeah. What I was, what was going to ask you as well, uh, you won the WMC belt a few years back as well. Like, Doyle was telling me that he reckons, in his opinion, that's probably the most prestigious tie belt. Yeah. yeah that's At like that time, one. for sure, the mm. WMC um, we're seeing a lot more of like the WBC probably mm. taking that those reins now as the most prestigious belt. But back then, yeah, the WMC was like the good one to get because like it is a ranking system. Like, um, and I had to fight like a, a top level tie to get the title. So yeah, it's a good belt to have. You, you won that in Bangkok, was it? In the big? No, I won that in here in Australia. Um, I just fought a tire that was ranked highly ranked, it's like number two in Lumpini and number five at Ratchadamna at the time. Yeah. So if you don't know Muay Thai, like 
in Thailand, there's the two big stadiums, Raj, Rajadamna and Lumpini, and that's like probably the most prestigious belts to get in the whole yeah. sport. Yeah. And they're like the tires that have been doing it since I was seven years old, you know, and it's like, it's almost like human cop fighting because like the camps have got big bets on these guys and the whole stadium's like betting on the fight. So there's some, yeah, big bets behind those top level fights. So, and yeah. Sorry? No, I was going to say, so that fight would have been like people pumping money into it when, when you fought for it. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, when you fought for the WMC belt, yeah, would there have been like a lot of people putting like big money on that fight? No, uh, no, I don't think so, man. I, I'm not sure if our camps mm. had bets, possibly because with my Thai coaches who can talk with the Thai people, Thai, so right, not right. that I'm aware of. No, yeah. yeah, it wasn't televised or anything like that. Like it was just yeah, and- just a fight that was um got put on YouTube a bit later. Yeah, right. I was I was quite interested after because um I was reading like your bio on uh on one championship and you won the belt and then you, you said you went do you go a bit um big headed or arrogant or something because you went yeah. you went away you went traveling and partying in Europe and then you went you yeah. had a fight then to go you took you had a K one fight in Japan yeah a big K one fight that was like and um got knocked out in the first round like just didn't take things too seriously thought i'd beat this guy easy and first time i kind of was a little bit cocky and yeah. um in the interviews like yeah I'll, I'll knock him out if not i'll buy everyone ice cream in the crown and, <laughs> and then i got starched absolutely knocked <laughs> out in the first round so yeah it's a good a good character building that's what my brother said you know i think you deserved it at that time <laughs> so you literally you you went away to uh, backpack in europe did you yeah that was a bad time yeah. hey that was um good time because i got I had a lot of friends that i met in training camps mm. uh in thailand so yeah. it was cool i got to stay at like different people's houses all around europe nice and yes yeah, good good time and then on, on the fight you when you had the fight for the k1 fight it was three weeks was it three weeks after your trip or something I, i'd come back i had about six weeks oh, and nice. i um stupidly like try to make this funny video on Instagram with me kicking a bag and chucking up a weight. I don't know why. And I kicked it and that put me on the sidelines a little bit. So oh. it made the camp very short. Yeah. Belly full of alcohol. And yeah. Yeah. Just, um, yeah, wasn't got what I deserved in the end, really. Yeah, right. Just didn't even stick to the game plan as well when we touched gloves. So I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> to try not to make that same mistake again, you know, like because that that would have set me up for like the world title shot in mm. the K one. So yeah, it's just a bit of a missed opportunity. Uh, that was in Japan as well, was it? Yeah, that was in Japan. They, they love they they love that. Uh, it's massive over there too, like K one and stuff, isn't it? Uh, Japan. Yeah, it used to be massive, but yeah. the thing with the Japanese is they they go through their phases a lot. So K one pride like. Mm. I guess in the 90s and early 2000s, like it was huge. They get hundreds of thousands of people to the mm. stadiums all over the news. You're like a superstar there when you fight. And then, um, yeah, that usually they just get into their phases of things. That's what like I, I was told. So then they sort of got over the martial arts, those big promotions, but it's still around. Yeah. But it's just not the level of what it used to be. So I think it was about 10,000 people at the stadium, That's which is still awesome. quite a lot. But yeah, um, compared to what they used to get and the money that the fighters used to get, like yeah, it's a lot less. I I read um, Mark Hunt's book, his autobiography, and yeah. obviously the K one was it night when did he win it? I can't remember the year now, but I read obviously his book. And when you read a book, you've got to go on, like I like I like to go back on YouTube and to say when he fought like was yeah. it like Mark <laughs> Le, Mark Lebanon and stuff. Yeah, and I'd watch it and like you said, like Mark Hunt when he was fighting in. Um, the K1 Grand Prix back like could be like 50,000, 60,000 fans there. And they, yeah. he, was like a, he was like a king. They treated Mark Hunt like a king, didn't they, in Japan? Yeah. yeah. And they were getting like millions of dollars, you know, mm. like for winning tournaments. Yeah. And um, yeah, proper superstars when they go in. So and, um, yeah, what a crazy, that's a good book. Like him just read sitting it? on the pokies for three days and like <laughs> you read it, have you uh, done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a good book. Yeah. It's um, crazy. 
he had a fucking mad upbringing too, man. I didn't realize, mm. like in in Auckland and stuff, the shit you went through, and yeah, right. and then yeah, it's pretty common too. Like you mm. speak to a lot of people from um, Auckland, and yeah, just common like the family sort of upbringing, the brutal I, dad and stuff like that. I was, I was, I, I, I know, like you were your mother's Thai and your dad's from Aussie, and you, you, you were born in Thailand, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. I was born in Thailand and then when I was about eight months old, they came back to Australia. Yeah. So they had my brother here, moved to Thailand for three years and then come back here. And I know you say like you you've uh you've had like your parents worked really hard and you know, get um what's the word? Yeah. Provide you the best they can and stuff. But like apart from that, did you did you have like uh you know, did you did you have a good childhood growing up? Like did you get, yeah, you know? man, I had a pretty, like, a good loving childhood from my parents and that. Yeah. But um, I was a very shy kid as well. So um, just sort of reserving myself a lot. And just, yeah, incredible shyness. That was, that was a big thing for me. And um, just uh, any sort of social setting, I'll get the red face, the, 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 the stutter, like having to do speeches at school, just stuttering. And that, that would get in my head, like, quite a bit. And that's probably what led me to like a lot of, I guess, other things that I wanted to try, like say like marijuana and mm. um, like psychedelics and stuff like that. And then floating, but then that done the opposite effect. So it made me a bit more comfortable in social settings after a while. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you're ne- you're you never into got- your CBD, hey man? I see you got, you, you got a sponsor. The CBD yeah, C- sponsor. CBD, uh, yeah, yeah. Like with with the weed, like I'm really bad off like weeds. You know what I mean? Like I remember going to Amsterdam, and I was uh I went out and I I thought I'd be like oh I can do this and that. And I was like smoking all the weed and stuff. And man, fuck, I had like the worst spin out there ever. You know what I mean? <laughs> and at the time it was like a like a festival on. Uh, well, uh-huh. fe- it was something going on. Have you been to Amsterdam? Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Been, pretty, times. pretty mental place, isn't it? Yeah. And on the square, it was like um. <laughs> there was something going on but it was like a haunted house there it was like rides um like, it was just like a fair going on and i came out of the, the coffee shop wherever and i was having a meltdown I, like i couldn't i was like spider-man stuck to the walls i was i couldn't deal with anyone look i was just gone and then the people i was with at the time wanted to put me in the haunted house and i was like maybe crying <laughs> of like I was, I was bad man but um yeah oh. T, T, thc is uh yeah i don't know maybe i have to uh, that's funny, like you say that. I remember one of my first times in Amsterdam, I caught up with a friend that was from Melbourne that actually met in Thailand, and he was there at the same time. So we ended up catching up and I'm like, we'll go to a coffee shop. He's like, fuck yeah. So I ended up getting this joint. Like, can we just have something like mild just because we're going to drink after something that's not yeah. going to put us on our hole? Mm. And then we're sharing this joint. And like, you know, we're talking at the start heat. So we just got to this point where we just sort of stopped talking to each other and just like little <laughs> paranoid. And I remember just seeing his eyes were just so red and closed. And I started feeling like exactly the same. And then we're like, oh, should we go to the pub? It's like, oh, yeah. Do you want to go? It's like, well, do you want to go? Like, yeah. All right. Let's just go for a walk. And then um, ended up walking a bit. And we're just like, oh, man, a bit, um, bit up high. It's like, do you want to just go home? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he ended up going back to his hotel. I'm just like, yeah, freaking got super paranoid. It was like yeah. seven o'clock at night. Didn't see our other mates as well. And it was a good introduction to Amsterdam. The weed was very strong. <laughs> yeah, I agree, man. It's, uh, it's a different ballgame over there. Like compared to Australia, UK, it's, uh, you go to Amsterdam, it's the weed super strong. And I think now they reckon like California, they reckon their weed is like really strong. You know, California. Yeah. Cause crazy like yeah the the science or the, the production and mm. the research that's going into it which is good in the u.s because it's starting to be like almost everywhere in the u.s is yeah. kind of like decriminalized but australia where I think- like I, I i got my script like i got a cbd and thc script nice yeah. and it's changing a little bit because like with my wrist pain and um the pains i get from fighting like yeah. i prefer to use that as opposed to like the tramadols that i was using yeah. previously or the panadol even yeah so it's cool that things are changing so there is more research going into it and you get products that are more better for you because weed's such a crazy plan right there's yeah. like 
course, yeah. You have stuff with more CBN, it'll do this, this will put you to sleep, this will make you eat. Like, so it's good that that's getting out there as a natural option. Yeah. I, th- I think as well, like with weed, you know, as long as you don't abuse it, it's like you said, it's people have it, give it a bad rap, don't they? But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think if I think I was just doing a bit, I was just showing off a bit when I was doing it, and uh, I paid the, <laughs> I, I paid the price, you could say, and I did some not so long. Well, I, last I went to Amsterdam, then I did some again, and I was trying to take yeah. my time, but like you say, the weeds are so strong over there, and it just creeped up on me, creeped up on me, and then I was like, fuck, I was with my yeah. missus at the time. I needed to get like you said, I needed to get out of the coffee shop and. <laughs> But, I uh, think it's I, any time, like every time after that, and when I've been back to Europe, I make sure it's like we got the stopover in Amsterdam because even just spending a day there, you know, yeah. and just the I never the flight home, I'm always asleep, so it's yeah. not even like I don't get the jet lag because like I know like I'll have a brownie or something before I go on the plane, and it just puts me out because it's a long flight from yeah definitely yeah. to Australia, so, so yeah, it's made a ho- habit of it. It's horrible, man. At least now. Uh... You can do Perth to London direct now, can you? Really? Yeah. Oh, I, didn't, didn't I think know. it's on Virg- Virgin or Qantas, maybe. Yeah, because yeah. when I my when my parents came out to see me uh, when I was living there, they did a from Heathrow, London to Perth. I think it's 15 hours straight there. Um, yeah. I don't okay. know if people would prefer I don't know if people would prefer that or I don't know. Because uh yeah, have a brownie, man, you'd be sweet. 15 yeah. hours. <laughs> or it could be the worst flight of your life and you could yeah. uh, freak oh, out wow. for 15 hours either one oh. but um yeah, yeah. it's um no I, because i hope uh i hope i can get back out towards like well i the plan is because my girlfriend's all australian she's uh living over here with me now oh, okay cool from melbourne so i think the long-term plan is to go back but at the moment yeah. it's fucking looking <laughs> shit like it's what's yeah. Perth like now with covid have they shut down Nah, like we've, if there's one case here in the community, they'll shut, that will make us go into lockdown. Yeah. Um, so it's at the moment, the other states, I think they're on lockdown, but mm. Perth is okay. But yeah. it's almost like you just, you know, it's almost like if the other states get affected, then eventually we'll go into lockdown again. It's just an uncertain time, man. The crazy thing is like, we can't leave the country. Like we have to get government approval. So my brother at the moment, he um, has quit his job and he's a Thai citizen as well. So he wants to go there because he hasn't seen his fiance in like a year and a half since since the border shut. He literally proposed to her and everything. And then he come back because he he works in a FIFA in the mine side. So he would usually live in Thailand and then work in Australia. Yeah, right. Then what happened was, so he seen her propose to her and he come back and then they shut the borders. So he's just, yeah, I'm um, being sucks for him. But um, so now he's quit his job. He's like, All right, I'm going to do a gap year in Thailand. Yeah. And he can't get exempt because he need, they need like someone sick who's dying or like they just, yeah, it's just hard to get approval from the government. Yeah. It's, it's a fucking yeah. bit of a joke there. Like, it's a joke. I mean, he's, a, he's a citizen, do you know what I mean? Like, and he can't go back to his, it's kind yeah. of different, you know? It's Have crazy. You got, like, you got I understand tight. getting back in, yeah, whatever. Like, might be a bit harder, but to leave, mm. like, that's, yeah. Pretty rough. Crazy. Are you, th- you're a Thai, th- obviously, you are a Thai citizen too, are you? Yeah, yeah. Thai citizen. Are you allowed two passports? Yeah, yeah in Australia yeah. and Thailand, you're allowed dual citizenship, which yeah, is pretty, pretty handy. Good, yeah. Yeah. My only downside is my Thai is not very good, so it's something I need to work on. Like it's it's a hard... Uh, well, you can you can you speak it bit like a lot of people with languages they can say I can understand it but I can't speak it. Are you a bit like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can definitely understand it a bit more, but it is getting progressively worse as well. Yeah. So it's just something that's in the back of my mind um, to uh, yeah get better at. Brush up on it, like no, oh, it's good. What? Um, yeah. So we're coming up to well, fuck now, forty five minutes, man, that's flown. Um, no, we, I just want to ask. Day. Yeah, I know. Jesus, it's good though. Um, what I was going to say to you, yeah. So obviously now with uh with one, just I know you say you need to be double vaccinated or go to Singapore and stuff, but mm-hmm. um, 
Well, what's, yeah. the plan, what's the plan, Zay? What, you know, you just staying ready uh, for something? So straight after the Rod Tank fight, there was, yeah, an opportunity for me to do MMA. Yeah. And I accepted it. And then that was sort of end of May. And then Singapore went into lockdown. So that fight got cancelled or postponed. Mm. And we're just sort of trying to stay ready the whole time. And um, the next date they were going to try is June 15th. But then that the show, yeah, Singapore wasn't completely clear yet. So then I got a call saying, all right, so you're because your MMA opponent's not vaccinated, his country, China, where he was from, they have to be vaccinated to get into Singapore. So we got you a kickboxing match now because Australians don't need to be vaccinated to get into Singapore because yeah. we're quite good here. So like sweet. Um, it's going to be end 30th of July kickboxing and I was getting ready for that. And then, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I just got the call saying uh, Australians now need to be fully vaccinated to get into Singapore. And it's not one's um, policy. It's just the country where they do the promotion. And yeah, right. Yeah. So that that's just where I'm sitting at now. So mm. at the moment, I don't mind just chilling out, just seeing how it's going so crazy at the moment anyway. So I'm not going to rush into things at the moment, but right now I just want to work on my ground a little bit more Yeah. and just, yeah, see what happens. Cause I don't even know. Yeah. It's just, just a weird time like yeah, with the vaccination and yeah. stuff like that. It is a, it's a strange, weird time, man. It's a, it is. And with, with one now, obviously you've got a contract. You're not, you could, if they ring you up and say, we want you to do, um, an MMA fight, it's no, you're not contracted to like a, a Muay Thai, the Muay Thai side of it. Yeah, no, nah, nah. contracted for both. Yeah. So it can be Muay Thai, MMA, or kickboxing. Yeah, yeah, cool. And that's, yeah, obviously one of my goals is to get yeah. to the highest level in those three sports and that promotion. Mm. So, awesome. Yeah, sort of, sort of what I'm working towards. But yeah, you can get exempt. So, one, depending, like, yeah, so some fighters, Contract for one's usually around two years, like the first one. So you can get exempt to find another promotions, but you just have to apply for it and they just yeah. let you know. Yeah. Oh, brilliant, man. I'm, I'm excited to see what, uh, what's on for the future for Mini T. And you know what? I didn't even ask you why they called you Mini T because I fuck it, I know. I looked into it. Doily asked me, he goes, ask him why they call him Mini T. I'm actually interested. But I said, I know why. <laughs> But yeah, tell, tell, why they call you? Min, tell the people why they call you Mini T. Yeah, so I come into the gym one day when I was about 14, 15 years old with a shaved head. And in our gym at the time, Cow Sock Muay Thai gym, when they trained at this like little shed, there was a big poster of Nathan Carnage Corbett versus Tyrone Spong. And one of the trainers said, hey, stand next to the poster. He's like, you look like Tyrone. I'm going to start calling you Mini Tyrone. Yeah. And then the whole gym just sort of got into it. And it was just from there, Mini Tyrone went into Mini T. And it's not a bad name to have, man. I look, no. um, Tyrone Spong's a bit of a legend. And definitely, uh, he's, he's into nature and stuff as well, which is what I'm all about and animals and that. So he's, um, yeah, he's a good fighter. He's a beast, man. Legend of the game, Tyrone Spong. Yeah, it, apart from you... the shin snap, but yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Been happening too much lately, eh? We've seen that a lot. Freaking Mate. Conor McGregor, man. Holy crap. That was insane. Like, I was a bit. Uh, what do you think of that fight? Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, I was sad how, mm. like, I know he's a bit of a, you know, just the way he speaks, and that was pretty yeah. at the end. Uncalled for, but he brings the show, man. And mm. like, a lot of people tuned in, tuned into the sport because of him. Yeah, definitely. like yourself, right? You said, nah, you, you, yeah, you're definitely a reason why I started as well. Yeah, exactly. So mm. it's kind of like brutal to see him go that way, but found it pretty funny how he's still like ready to fight with his legs snapped. <laughs> Um, but there, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know, man. He looked good the striking at the start, but I think Poya, once he got him down, and I think that was his way forward too. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yep. What did, what did you think? Yeah, man, I think um, like first Minero to McGregor came out, but he saw like three spinning back kicks straight away, didn't he? He was like, he yeah. came out different approach to his first fight. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, what happened? I think McGregor went. Did McGregor shoot it in or something? I can't remember now. I think so. Maybe on the cage. Yeah, yeah it's like a it's like a meme on Instagram. I think wasn't it like um, because McGregor was saying stuff. Whoever shoots first, a bitch or something, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it was like McGregor fucking shooting for uh, 
<laughs> and then he goes, uh, I don't class submissions as a as a win. And then, and then he goes, he goes to the go over the guillotine and stuff. But uh and then the stretcher bit as well. <laughs> yeah, that's what about on the stretcher thing. You'll be going out on a stretcher and then it's yeah, McGregor. But um like yeah, karma, hey? I know, I know. I think um, yeah, I don't know, man. Like you'll cut I think he'll definitely come back whether he fights mm. Poria again. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. We should fight. Maybe an RDA, maybe. That's a tough matchup again, though, isn't it? You know, uh, yeah. Alfonso Sandros. Such a crazy division, that division. Yeah, it's, uh, it is mad. Did you watch the fight on Saturday, the Dillashaw? I did. I, um, I, I actually fell asleep during it, and it was a crazy fight. But I don't know why. I was, but I, I remember... Um, I need to watch it again, but yeah. yeah, I've heard it was an awesome fight. And the fight before that with the, the bantamweights is a wicked fight as mm. well. But um, yeah, what did you think of that? Because I remember waking up, waking up my missus. I was like, fuck, who won? She's like, yeah, Dillashaw. Yeah, it's, well, <sighs> ah, it's a tough one. It's a, it, is, it is a tough one in my opinion. Like Because it was it, close, hey? It was, yeah, it was very close, yeah. Yeah. Like, my honest opinion, I... I, I'm not mad. At, I if, if they raised Sandhagen's hand, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have been mad, but I, I wasn't yeah. mad at the Dillashaw. Sandhagen landed some big shots in him, man. He landed like three flying knees. See yeah, a couple right. of photos floating around on social media. Yeah. And um good punches. Sandhagen striking so good. He's like yeah. so slick, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. fucking big. He's five foot eleven. I didn't realize he's huge, he's, man. Yeah. Like Bantam, right? Holy shit. That's a that's a big guy, like and he was TJ yeah. looked really small next to him, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad TJ TJ's a good fighter, you know, without with or without the the EPO stuff, he's he's a good fighter. So yeah, it'd be yeah. interesting to see now how where he goes from here and if they give him the winner of uh, Jan and Sterling, maybe. Yeah, still, but, that's um, gonna be a good fight. Yeah, so it's um, no, it's uh, some good good fights coming up. I don't know. Is it you got Derek Lewis fighting soon now, Neil? Against yeah, Cyril, Cyril Carney. That'd be fun if he wins. Uh, he's a very marketable guy now, isn't he? Derek Lewis. He's just funny. Yeah. He's a funny guy. And like. it's just at that weight, too. You just do mm. not want to cop a punch from those guys. Good night. There's no, no. two ways about it. Do, do you see um Jackass? Is they're doing Jackass 4 now? Have you heard about that? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> But one of the one of the things on the show, and they haven't announced which jackass it was, but it was to take a net, a punch to the balls of Francis Ngannou. Oh, what? A punch. And uh, yeah, I was listening to a Michael Michael Bisping's podcast, and B- Ngannou was like, "Why? You know, I'm not going to punch this guy in the ball." <laughs> so the director goes, "No, no, you got to do it." So Ngannou like punched him in the nets, and then the director oh, said, "No, no, no." Is- the director said, no, no, we, we know you can punch harder than that, Francis. And Francis is like, are you serious? So apparently Francis fucking gave it proper welly. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think they Paralyzed said... Paralyzed him again. Yeah, I think they rep- his, uh, his ball ruptured or something, which is... Fuck, man. You know? Expecting. Nagano Nga- punching him in the balls. Fuck. Ugh. <laughs> it wasn't... Uh, what, one know. for the storybooks? <laughs> you know? I know, so... It'd be interesting to see which one it is. Maybe like Steve or something like that. He's pretty mad, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, that, that's pretty cool that they're doing a jackass four. Yeah. They'll, they'll all get a bit on now. They'll be in their 40s. And, I yeah. know. They, they must... I don't want to say they skint or nothing, but, uh, yeah, they must just miss the buzz of it, I suppose, doing silly things. That, that probably explains why I've seen a photo of Johnny Knoxville pop up, but they were talking about like just how much he aged kind of thing because he looks like a lot older like since you know watching when he's coming out before yeah i haven't yeah. seen johnny yeah johnny knox i haven't seen a photo of him going about but like, like yeah you would have lived a few lives mm, but like steve was massive mma fan isn't he he's always like yeah he has like a few like bisping and john bones on his podcast and stuff he's um he, he gets into it a fair bit like yeah, but uh, listen, Mini T, appreciate you coming on, brother. It's uh, cheers, Kerry. Thanks for having me on, man. Six o'clock, my end. I gotta get yeah, ready. For my, work. Yeah, I gotta get <laughs> ready for my grind now, but no, like I said, appreciate you coming on. Um, looking forward to see what the future holds for you. Uh, yeah. any shout outs you want to give where we can find you on social media, anything like that, or any sponsor shout outs? Oh, man, um, uh, not, not really. Just shout out to everyone, hello to everyone that's helped me in this journey. So 
yeah and i'm um, always cool chatting to people from different countries and seeing your way of life as well yeah. so yeah appreciate you getting me on awesome mate daniel mini t williams everybody all right thank you man hope to get over there one day peace